as in syncopation, so a little project we've worked on, <laughs> took um, every ABCD day off, so it's like six hours a day, and um, put a lot of work in, and we made this presentation about it. We each had a bit of a different question. My question was, it evolved a lot throughout the project. It started much more directly relating to even learning Pro Tools and the, learning the recording processes around that. Eventually, we'll get to it later again, but I, we decided to stick with GarageBand. And it went through, my question at one point was even about like the songwriting processes. It ended up being, how do I use GarageBand to make an album out of my own home? And what are the pros and cons of it as a DAW? A DAW being a digital audio workstation, like the interface you have on your computer to record it. And this is basically my paragraph saying, all that kind of stuff. Um, we found you spend dozens of hours experimenting, writing harmonies, melodies, trying drum parts, just doing absolutely random stuff to come up with every like, I don't know, 30 seconds of stuff you're actually satisfied with. Uh, you, I'm definitely a bit OCD perfectionist with a lot of things, especially recording. And when it comes down to it, especially during those beginning drafting phases, you've got to learn to turn that off. <laughs> Otherwise, you will never finish anything. I've spent hours, I have one guitar solo on one of my tracks that's on take number like 127 or something ridiculous and I still don't like it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, my I ended up just basically, the point of my project was to find out of my own basement, I live in the basement, out of my own home, uh, how to find the best techniques to get the best sound quality out of what is thought of as a very kind of amateur dog garage band. Yeah, so these are some musicians I like. That's Elliot Smith. That's I guess it's Sufjan Stevens. I thought it was Subjan Stevens, but um, that's Tom Waits and John Lennon. And um, they just all four of them. I like looked at them and some more artists, like their um, kind of recording techniques, like what they did different, what made them stand out, and you know what made their music like resonate with so many people. So I just kind of looked at the more technical techniques they used. And stuff. So um, I just learned about like. Um, a lot of musicians record like demos on um, tapes, like four tracks. Like that's what Elliot Smith did, and uh, we did that in Italy. We brought a um, tape deck to Italy and recorded a couple things. And um, the Beatles are a, probably the best example of recording techniques. They did a lot of crazy stuff, and they just had like amazing ideas. Like their producer was really great, and um, so I just I read about a lot of different artists and yeah how they made their music. So coming up with the song ideas, well, the best way for us at least is to kind of just jam, have a good time, and find stuff that starts to actually kind of like catch your ear and that you're the most satisfied with just when you're first coming up with it. We have hundreds of tracks on his computer. We'll have a video in a sec of us just scrolling through a lot of them. Um, but some of them are just like 15 seconds of like layered harmonies we thought worked well together, and sometimes we just record an hour and a half jam session and then go back through and listen to it anything that we liked when we were first going through it, or just, because why not? <laughs> we rarely used, like, actual theory for our ideas. Like, we, we would sometimes try and, like, base it around theory, but they would, no. <laughs> we would just end up kind of just having a good time just playing until yeah. we just found something we liked. Um, yeah, sometimes we'd actually try to write a song with something in mind going into it, but almost every time it failed. We just kind of got influenced by the music we were making in the moment. Like, we couldn't influence our music with the idea going into it in the first place. We had, we had a lot of concepts going into it. Yeah, we like had a lot, lot of them went, there we go, and we have none right Yeah, we had like, deep, them all. Yeah, deeper album concepts for like the whole album, but in the end, each song itself kind of formed its own idea. There wasn't any kind of overarching idea that we had coming through it. And then these are just pictures of just, these are some of my projects on my computer that I just took pictures of. <laughs> well, this is this one. This clicker does not click. This is supposed to be that short video. Yeah, come up for a second. It, it may or may not. Anticipation's half the fun. 
I'm gonna say it's not. It's we can move on. Yeah, it's not that important. It's a video. Just imagine, <laughs> imagine about 300 projects just being scrolled through for about 15 seconds, just months of us making random things. <laughs> it's just on one of our computers. Too, yeah. So. Uh, lyrics. We're terrible at that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we try. Um, we would constantly get sidetracked trying to just. Uh, what? Oh yeah, we could not actually put words on anything. We, the best um, concept we came from making words actually worked when the two of us would work together. He, making up melodies and like harmonies and things for songs has a lot of gibberish that comes out, <laughs> unintelligible words that have the melody that's in his head. And then at some point, I grabbed that journal and I would just start writing the words I thought I heard him singing, which <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they would match up. No, there was some poetry in here. Yeah, but, <laughs> like, we found some beautiful words. He had no idea. He said it. I didn't know how I heard it. But when we put the two together, we came up with definitely the best lyrics we had. And just, yeah, we, we, went, we sat for hours trying to come up with love songs, sad songs, some sort of actual story. We grew up on Martha's Vineyard. We've lived very awesome lives, so we have no experience. <laughs> yeah. we, we don't really have that much of a <laughs> Wait for more of that struggle to really get inspired. <laughs> yeah, we ended up just taken from nothing in the end. <laughs> Liam's lyrics, my lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> this is the comparison of the lyric writing. Um, yeah. I think I think that's there's one of these that actually has stuff, yeah. Um Oh, you probably can't read it. No Mud Clan. These are these ones are all from Italy, I think, when I was listening to Jesse just yeah. trying to record a song, and this is all me in Italy just writing random things I thought he Someone was saying. Someone's just dancing on your shoulder. Or something. Yeah, it was some know. cool, like, some cool stuff going on that really makes no sense, but we can say it does. Um, so yeah, the DAW is the Digital Audio Workstation. Uh, the original project for me and for both of us was to learn Pro Tools from Charlie. He knows Pro Tools in and out, and I was hoping to like learn some of the tricks of it. And after one of the first meetings with him, we really went and looked at Pro Tools, and it is a lot more complicated than a doll like GarageBand. There's opportunity to go much further in depth in your equalizing and your effects, and okay. just GarageBand is yeah like, mainly it's very amateurish. And it doesn't have much of like a mixing aspect. Like a lot of Pro Tools is how you like get the different sounds layered. And GarageBand is best at just recording the tracks and putting them in there. GarageBand is meant to be the free DAW that anybody <laughs> can kind of understand and be compatible with when you first download a Mac. And it's supposed to influence you to when you finally basically get good enough at it, you can't do what you want to do in you Logic. <laughs> so it's supposed to be just simple enough to really start understanding how to use a DAW. And since we also had really not done any recording and not much writing ourselves, just sticking with the amateur DAW wasn't that bad. Because also, contrary to what I had originally believed, the DAW doesn't really affect your recording sound quality. That's more the interface you plug into it. And for us, the, we'll get to it again, but the interface we mostly used was called the Scarlett 2i2 Focus Ray. It has a USB, plugs right into the side of my computer. It has two inputs, quarter inch and XLR, so it can take in a guitar or a mic on either side. And that was pretty much all we ever needed. And that just went straight into GarageBand. And it would have been the same thing we used if we used Pro Tools or Reaper or <coughs> any sort of DAW. Pro Tools is also very expensive. Yeah, there's a deal like $100 a year for students, but it's usually like $800 or something yeah. like that. And GarageBand is nothing, which is mm -hmm. nice. So these are some just other DAWs and like their layout. So GarageBand's pretty simple. This is all pretty low resolution. But Logic, that's the next version of GarageBand that Apple wants to sell you. That is their version of Pro Tools. That's Reaper. That's We were actually recommended to try Reaper, but didn't get a chance by uh, Mr. Diagostino. That's the DAW he likes to use. And then Ableton is just another one. So some GarageBand pros is that it's <coughs> simple, very easy to get the hang of. If you've never looked at a DAW in your life, you can probably figure out how to record something your first try. It's free. And it also has a EQ bands. EQ is just your equalization of the track you're working on. And on a lot of DAWs, there aren't that many bands, sometimes even one band. But on GarageBand, you have eight individual band all set to different hertz levels. And you can, if you want them louder or more varied, you can choose the higher hertz, the lower hertz, and mess with them. And that's eight, having eight different bands to work with gives you a lot of area to really mess with sound. 
what's cool with that especially is like you can turn just the most random sound into something really cool. Just like scratching or just like hitting something. Yeah. It can turn into like a really like useful sound just with messing with the equalizer. Yeah, one of the I've done that a lot. It's, it's like, one of the things about GarageBand that was a little deterring at first was that some <coughs> the effects that are involved in GarageBand can be a little amateur sounding in themselves, the effects that are built in, but we would rarely ever just use the effects. If you take the effects, some of them sound better than others, especially on the new version of GarageBand, which has some pretty good effects, but then you go in and you totally mess with the EQ, then it doesn't sound quite so cheesy and amateurish anymore. We only use the effects. Yeah, we, we pretty much, we did, yeah, there'll be some pictures later. Sometimes we would actually take my guitar and plug it through an amplifier or put something like a Shure 57 preferably, sometimes we'd use a 58 because we didn't have a 57, and then some uh, condenser mic further away and use the two mic setup to record an amplifier and try and get more actual live sounds. But that was a lot harder to do well. So we ended up mostly just plugging my guitar directly into this, just the cable goes straight from the guitar into the quarter inch input and then straight to GarageBand, and you don't need any mics at all. Um, cons of GarageBand, so this is a huge con, especially in the drafting, is the clicks with the loops. The easy way to fix that is to just record through your song like you kind of should with songs, just beginning to end your whole part. But GarageBand, as many people who have ever messed with it probably know, easily you finish your track and then you can just loop it as many times as you want. But with GarageBand, there's often a click that you hear every time it goes through that loop. And the one of the easiest ways to fix that is something called crossfading which this is an example of taking two separate tracks actually in Pro Tools. You put them next to each other and fading from one track till it goes quiet is easy enough. It just gets quieter. But cross fading is when the track that you're going into also slowly gets louder as the other one's getting quieter. So you don't really notice these two tracks going into one another. And GarageBand just doesn't have that option. And so those... You can do it. It's just complicated. Yeah, you have two different tracks. So. With Pro Tools, you just go to crossfading, and it just automatically crosses two tracks you're trying to put together, or it crosses over the click, or whatever it is you're working on, and it's much more com complex doing GarageBand. Another problem is, what you'll see in the song we're going to play for you guys, that we really like the style of kind of changing in the middle of a song to what would almost be <clears throat> an entirely different song. And in GarageBand, you can't change the tempo of your metronome within the song. And so trying, if you try to, it'll completely mess with whatever's already on the project. And so trying to take something from another project and drop it in and then actually work on it, you just have to work on it by ear. You can't use a metronome. Sometimes Jesse would take his phone instead of the metronome and put one earbud in and try and work off the metronome off his phone to try and keep in time with the new piece we had in our project. Um, Pro Tools, you can just switch yeah, the tempo, and it's very easy. Yeah, gives you a lot more control. Um, the preset amps, like we talked about, and effects can sound a bit amateur and cheesy themselves. Uh, we didn't really realize at first until we started having bigger projects, but there's a serious epidemic of disappearing tracks within GarageBand. <laughs> You'll go into it the next day or an hour later, and something will be like a measure earlier than it was, or all of a sudden there's a chunk in the middle that's just gone. No, that's the worst one, a tiny piece of Yeah, music. like today yeah. I just went into something we made in Italy, and there was just like half a second just gone. Just wasn't there anymore. And I don't know how it happens. One of the problems with having a free dog, I guess. But, and then also they, they purposely limit their controls somewhat, so once you actually get involved in the recording process, you want to go and buy Logic the next step up. Um, we, one of the reasons we also picked GarageBand originally was because uh, we had worked for a couple weeks before we even got started on the project, um, just messing around in Jesse's house in his basement, recording random things, and then we went to Charlie and tried to put some of our projects in Pro Tools, and we couldn't. Everything got messed up, we couldn't, we'd have to re-record anything we'd already made, which it turns out now we're barely using anything we used from the beginning anyway, so we're not going to be able to do. But later on, just a, like a few days ago, a week ago, we went to Mark Cohen's house, a friend of my dad, and somebody who I played music with, who's an incredible musician, and he's like a faux recording engineer. But um, he taught me about stems, which is when you s consolidate one track in your song, so it's the only thing being played, and then you record it from time zero to the end. And it basically becomes a song of only that track and only that part of the song. And then you make a stem, as you can see, for every single track and every single instrument. 
And then also what you can do is if you're going from something like GarageBand to Pro Tools, I made a stem of every affected instrument I had and every not. I took off the effects, so I made a clean stem of everything so that he could also try his effects if he thought he had a better effect than I had used in the first place because we were using GarageBand. So I thought he might have some better sounds to use. And so you make, there's a lot more stems than this. And as you can see, these are all actually stems that were meant to be on the same song. But these were stems we had to make from time zero on the original song. These were stems we made that we were putting part of a song from a different song into it. And so those ones won't actually line up. But the reason they're starting all at time zero is so that even if there's nothing in the beginning of the stem, they all eventually line up, all your stems, so that you have the whole song, even though each one is kind of its own song. But we would, for all the ones that were from a separate song, we had to line them up separately and then splice them on the end so that it would all sound like one piece in itself. Um, and then interfaces. So the main interface, we really mo mainly use this. We borrowed this from Charlie within the first week and a half of the project. And we love it. It's actually the, if you buy Pro Tools, it is the, um, the interface that comes with Pro Tools itself. Um, it has two inputs, like I said, XLR and quarter inch inputs, both of them, so it can take a mic or a guitar. Um, and you just switch to either a line or an instrument, depending on which one you're using at the time. It also has 48 volts, which is phantom power. When you're using nice studio microphones, most of them need what's called phantom power, which is a, like an extra source of energy to help actually work the microphone. The only mics we used that didn't need that were like a Shure SM58, which is the very standard performance microphone that you probably all think of if you think of somebody performing on stage. It's all we mostly use for performances. But every other mic we used needed phantom power. And I'll just show you, this is the condenser mic we use for the most part. Audio Technica 2035. We also borrowed this from Charlie. Same, actually the next time I saw him after this, about a week after. But it has a couple switches on the back. It has 0 dB and minus 10 dB, which is just a unit of measurement for sound. You can either do 0, which means it does nothing but takes what you give it. Or you can do minus 10, which is when you're recording if someone's screaming. Or if you're recording, I don't know, some sort of crazy distorted guitar, you put minus 10 dB so that your recording itself is a little quieter, less chance of feedback and distortion. And then there's also a low cut switch, which will help drop off the low end. If you put it on, then when you're recording, if you're recording a ton of instruments, like a ton of guitars and a ton of voices, you might want to drop the low end. Otherwise, it'll all stack up track after track so you get this low underlying buzz of annoying sound, just like this bass buzz that the mic picked up one track at a time. You don't hear it in each consolidated track. We'll play every track at once, and all of a sudden, there's just this low buzz, which cutting off the low end during your recording process helps you. Oh, that's, this is the one I had. This yeah. is um, called a Motu interface, and um, Liam's dad let me borrow that. And um, it's not very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's very it's very fuzzy, and um, the one of the inputs doesn't work. It's just a much so, it's a much older interface. Than yeah, we put for for the sake of comparison, this is one of the new Motu interfaces. They've they've really come a long way in their style. However, I'm very grateful because that's like everything I've done is on that, and without it, I wouldn't have done anything. So, yeah. but it, it has been a little bit difficult. Um, it is otherwise pretty much the same thing. It has two inputs rather than both in the front. It has one on the back, one in the front, which is kind of a random design, but that's how they do it. But most of the interface is the same. It's just an older interface, and yeah, the sound quality isn't quite the same or as nice. And then this is, I don't know if you'd really call this an interface, but this was the other thing we used to record. When we went to Italy, we brought uh, X18 Fostex four-track tape recorder. It only takes quarter-inch inputs. It won't take a regular XLR mic cable with the three little dots on it. So what we actually had was a very short cable that plugged. I had never seen it before, but it's an adapter to plug an XLR into your mic, and then a quarter-inch comes out, like a guitar cable. And then we could plug that into the uh, four-track tape recorder. Only two of them worked, though. Yeah, it, it was really cool. Though. Yeah, it was awesome to work yeah, with. It, it was, was a little touchy. So it's like you get a way more authentic, like, um, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's a specific kind of sound, it's like very warm, mm -hmm. and it's it's untouched, and it's like raw. I it really was surprising like it. how nice the yeah. tone was, especially because the guitar we plugged directly in, we didn't mic the guitar, I just had my pickup fixed on my guitar actually, so we could just plug the guitar right into it, 
and not have to worry about the mic picking it up well. And it also, because with a tape recorder, pretty easy to just take the tape in and flip it over. After the first night, he recorded some random song idea. Then the second day, I accidentally put it in backwards, and it sounded way cool. Sounded awesome, yeah. <laughs> and so that's, we actually have one of our songs starts with just the backwards track of him coming up with a song idea that we ended up using to like go into a guitar part for the next song. Um, and so at, before we even really got yeah, to, yeah. that song, you guys bought me that one. No, no, that that one. one. So it's it's what they use for. Um, I think uh, we learned that it's typically used for like radio. <laughs> so it's a like very mid range. This um, one, the blue yeti. Yeah, but it, we did a lot of stuff on there. And yeah, it was, before it was the project. Yeah, those, those were the early days. It's very <laughs> fun. Before the project um, even started, and we had borrowed anything from Charlie, and we had we weren't taking any days off from school yet. We were. I had one of these, which is called a Blue Spark Digital Lightning Condenser. It'll, it has the little lightning condenser thing to plug right into your iPad or the USB to plug into your computer. And that one sounds all right. This one, like it was, yeah, it has. It's meant to pick up mid-range frequencies. It's really good. It was, we were yeah. just using it for the wrong thing. Yeah, it's meant to pick up like a human speaking voice. So any low notes and high notes, it's not gonna get very well. And also, but they don't need any phantom power. So it, you could just plug the thing straight into your computer, and you didn't need an interface, you didn't need anything, it would just record straight into your audio track. And these were, as far as mics went, we tried uh, even recording at first with like a Shure SM58, which is usually a performance mic, but we just tried recording with it because we had one, and we didn't know why not to, but it, there's a lot of reasons why not to, it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> um, and it's it, the SM58 and the SM57 are internally identical. We didn't ever actually really get much opportunity to use an SM57. One of the techniques I talked about earlier that Charlie recommended was putting a 57 in front of your amplifier and then the condenser a little further away around head height. But his 57, when he told me about the idea, didn't work at the time. But he just said to use the 58 because they actually are the same thing except for the windscreen on top. So I still use the 58. and. Um a lot of it's the room, it like picks up a lot of background noise, so you need one of those fancy soundproof rooms for it to really work. Um, but I've used it a lot. It, it does come through all right, but um, you just get a lot of buzz, so it's not ideal. And then this one we used a decent amount. This is an SM81. It's a condenser mic, and it, we ended up not using that one quite as much as the 2035. But yeah, it, but it is a very nice mic, and it's great for picking up like acoustic guitar or just any sort of acoustic instrument. We did try recording vocals with condenser mics like this a little bit, but it doesn't. It's not great. You, you're meant to use mics more like this. If you breathe into it, it yeah, it sounds really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to the SM81 are the CAD CM217s. They're basically the same thing, just cut in half. And this tool. That's really good at recording guitar, though. Yeah. And acoustic instruments gets a really nice range. They're meant to also. We actually meant a lot of time used one of them at a time, which sounds great, but they come in pairs pretty often because you're meant to be able to actually record in stereo. And they're also great for overhead on a drum set, recording the cymbals and that kind of thing. That's the mic they're the best for. And then this is just a picture of that 2035, which is a very all around versatile mic that we ended up using really more than anything. A lot of vocals, a lot of acoustic guitar, a lot of just whenever we were recording with a mic, we often used that. And we never use this, but yeah, this, this this can like it cancels out the vibrations, it like, holds it up. So it's that's as, really cool. I, I kind of wish we would use that. As close as you can get to just having a mic floating in space is huge. Yeah, eventually. And then we also didn't mess with it much, but I have it up in there as well. Just a sure KSM forty four, which is higher quality than really any of the other mics we have. It's one of my dad's mics, and it's just another. Nice condenser. The only we just ended up mostly using the AT2035 because the other thing is we all, we'd all the time come back to things we've recorded earlier on again later in the project, and it's much harder to find the same or at least close to the same sound if you're using a much more complicated mic setup. So using the same mic for most things just made it much easier to go back and work on something that you'd already recorded without worrying about it not sounding right, and then. Part of the setup. So this is my room, and these are a lot of the guitars we use. This is not a great picture at all. But so for all, as far as electrics go, that's my Tele, and this is my hollow body. The hollow body is actually right there also. Um, hollow bodies have a much warmer sound than the Tele. This is also just my hollow body is a much nicer instrument, so I ended up going to it most of the time, just in general for electric recording. But these are 
for the most part, the two electric guitars on any of the tracks. He also has a Squire Strat. Well, um, there are pictures of that one. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, so this is your bass. Yeah, it's my bass yeah. that is also the bass on most tracks. It's a Schefter. And, um, um, that's a classical, I guess, your grandma's boyfriend. My grandma's boyfriend's yeah. classical. So yeah. we've had it there for a while. <laughs> I have a tailor that I love. Um, doesn't tune so well. I, I, I needed to buy like tuning pegs for about six months. I haven't gotten around to it. So um, I'm using the classical. And I didn't like it at first. Now I really love it. So it's really full. It's not that fun to play, but it just it sounds really good. And um, then that's my Strat. It's a Squire. It's very cheap. Um, but I, I just need to replace some things on it. I, I really like it. Use it a lot. And then that's a bass I just got. We got that like halfway through the project. Yeah, we picked. We went and picked it up. You almost got a car. Yeah, um, it was yeah. a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's pretty good. I also need to put new strings on it, but. I got it like five hundred dollars less than it's worth, so that was good. Um, and then this is my dad's good old acoustic guitar, which is an amazing instrument. It's basically any time we had to record, record acoustic, except for when he was using the classical, we just always use this. There is no pickup in it; it can't be plugged directly into one of these, as some acoustics can. You'd have to mic it, but still, the we often mic it with the twenty thirty five, and it sounded really good. It always sounds always. Oh. And then, so these are our setups we went through. Yeah, our so first setup that we were using even before we started doing the project was at Jesse's. It was just his desktop. You can see the interface right there, his guitar. Um, I didn't talk about it that much, but whenever you hear... I was broken, but uh, this is the one that works. Yeah, whenever you hear drumming so far in anything we've recorded, it's this. <laughs> I did not drum on anything. It's you, If you plug this into GarageBand and go under the sound effects, you could pick horn, wind instruments, anything. And all of a sudden, all the keys of this will turn into different either drums or pitches of that instrument. And for a lot of the, for the most part, the synth sounds aren't very good, but the drums, compared to the pre made garage band drums, just yeah, hitting you're, keyboards a, yourself are a lot. There's a drummer like track, you hit the drummer guy, and he makes some random beat for you, and it's always terrible. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> yeah. But and, um, yeah. and that's my drum set. Uh, my uncle actually like put stuff on it, made it sound a lot cooler. We, haven't, we don't know how to record that, so we haven't really recorded live drums yet. I think we're going to do that at the school, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but we, we, have, we used to, when we were jamming more, the experimental days, we um, used the drums a lot. Yeah, so, we um, still jam with the drums, but we're planning on going into the pack. And we're going to keep, this EP we're going to keep working on until I leave in early July to go to... It's a good month. Yeah, and we're just, we just want to keep working on it. And... Any of the drums you will hear is kind of a placeholder for when I can record live drums over what's there, but they're still not that bad sound. And then this is just the setup. This is, if you can't tell, but there was also sometimes a setup that I used a couple times sitting on this couch that I'm on now. There was a table right in front that I would just put my laptop, my laptop on and plug this into, and it would just look like what he had just on the bench, and we'd be working independently. The first couple months, we pretty much always worked independently. We like we, well, were we jammed. Working. We jammed yeah. a lot, and then we recorded separately. Yeah, we'd always end up just yeah. recording our own things. It took a while before we would actually like sit next to each other and work with each other. <laughs> um, and then once I started, like, I, beginning of my project, I didn't live in my basement. But once I did, I had I started record, setting up a whole recording setup down there, and that ended up being our main recording area, which is we let sit on my bed for the most part, and you can kind of see. Early on in the project, I bought a couple of Mackie stereo 5-inch speakers that I put on top of the library uh, bookcases in my room. And then you could sit on the bed and have the two angled stereo speakers as you would want in a studio setup. And this is just me recording some drums. You can tell here, uh, that's the Audio-Technica mic. And our mic stand broke a few weeks ago. And so there's a whole um, tying setup. No, oh, yeah. I, I tied a guitar cable around it, like around the bottom of it. And then you got kind of pissed because um, it was a good guitar cable. So he went in, replaced it with some string, and then problem solved. Yeah, and it, it works really well. I mean, you only want to record at one height all the time. But it oh, can, go, can go right to left all you want. How are we for time? Like, how are we going? <coughs> how are we for time? Oh, I think you're at 30. Oh, 25? All right, and it's 30 max, right? I, I, don't know. Kevin, I, think I just don't want to get too much so, yeah. yes. Oh, these are these. So yeah, this is a closer picture. These are just the two Mackie speakers that I had set up on my bookcase to because we would often record with 
don't know if I brought them back, just Beats headphones. And their Beats are fine, very overpriced, but still good. Um, the main problem with them is Beats add a lot of bass into their own headphones because they know everyone likes bass now. And so if you're recording with them, you'll automatically hear too much bass. It won't be the same amount that you'll hear when you put them through speakers that actually play them how, they, how the music is. So it's a good thing, never mind just to hear it in different places, hear it in your car, just to make sure your mix is all right. But because we were using Beats to record for the most part, we wanted to pretty much any time we tried to mix anything, then put it on a different set of speakers to make sure it wasn't just like unequal amounts of bass as it would be if we only used the Beats to listen to the music. And this is just some pictures. This is you can see I looped it around the bottom and up top like four or five times to keep the mic stand from just falling over. And this was yeah, this was pretty much the main setup. We just put the computer on the table. And then there was the pedal board. Yeah, there were times when I tried to use my pedal board and put the guitar through it. The first day I used it, I literally wasted the entire day just trying to get the thing to work because. Um, if you know how pedal board, pedal board works, there's little guitar cables that are about this long that just plug between each pedal into the next until it goes in the guitar, into the pedal board, and out the last pedal and into the amplifier. And if one of those, if your sound isn't getting through when everything's plugged in, that means one of your little connectors is broken. No way to figure out which connector unless you test every single connector one by one. And the worst part is when it's three. <laughs> and you spend an entire day finding these three little broken connectors, plus that, maybe that was one of the three. Yeah, I think it was three total, but I wasted the whole day just trying to figure out why I couldn't get sound on my pedal board. And ended up figuring out that these three were all broken, which was very annoying. Um, and this is just a closer look at the little cables that connect your pedals and your pedal board. That's Jesse recording. Hey, he's actually using an SM58 in that. We did earlier. We yeah, used we the, the 58s just for like a week or two. Mm -hmm. We switched to the other one. And then when we were in Italy, this is our recording <coughs> setup. We took the four-track tape recorder, and we'd have the uh, 58 taped onto a chair, and mm -hmm. just run that directly into the recorder, and then out the guitar and into the four-track as well. We and taped the microphone to the chair. Yeah, we. That was <laughs> the best way to go about it. We figured out. Um, <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Uh, these are the tapes. This is a. These are all pretty low quality tapes. It ended up the one thing we really kept, the thing that went in backwards. We actually did record onto one of these pretty low quality tapes, but then we did actually have one at least higher quality tape. I don't really know how nice of a tape it is, but we didn't end up really recording anything on it. Oh, it was cool. At one point, like, um, with one of the blank tapes, you could hear like the faintest thing, like the faintest music, and we figured out that when the tapes were wiped, like, there were still remnants of the, what was on it before, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, there's faint stuff going on there. Yeah. Uh, and this was just the configuration I had for recording. I had a SM58, which was the only mic I brought, and then I brought a really short guitar cable and a short adapter to plug the XLR into the mic and then into the quarter-inch jack on the four-track tape recorder. And then just Monday, we took one of our songs that we had on GarageBand. We're starting to get really comfortable in GarageBand. Pretty sure Jesse's going to get the student model of Pro Tools pretty soon. And we took one of our songs and I made stems of every track, every instrument, and I emailed them all to Mark. And then we went to his house for the day and just put them all in Pro Tools. And he helped work on it a bit and work on some transitions. Some, some of the transitions are more or less we might change, but they were really good ideas to work on. You'll hear it on the song we're going to play, but it was just messing with ideas. And then this is also just ways he self-soundproofed his room that I thought was interesting. He made just this foam layered cardboard. He had that on his fan. Those are actually from my dad, I think he borrowed. Um, and this is just Jesse and Tempe lighting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these are, this was his setup that he had. He just would sit and he had his keyboard hooked up to his um, computer so he wouldn't actually mess around on his computer itself. It would just be the monitor he would look at. And then he had his, he has the same speakers, pretty similar as the one that Charlie does, except inverted colors. And watching him work was really interesting because he, he knew it so well and he could just zip through. Mm -hmm. and he, he was a little bit like, I don't know, there's, it's very easy to, to clean it up, I think, just too much with Pro Tools, but I really like the mix he made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, the song you're gonna, we're going to play is a song that's kind of meant to be a bit murky and kind of in the distance in a way. He, did, he really cleaned up like the lower frequencies, so it sounds a lot like cleaner, 
But um, I think we can pretty easily, like, we yeah. wouldn't change that much. It sounds really We kind of like the yeah. marginess at the same time, so we need to find somewhere kind of between. we got to figure it out, yeah. And, yeah, this is just another close-up picture. One of the other problems we realized we had is when we were recording on GarageBand, sometimes the gain, if, if you don't have it up enough, the actual waves themselves, when you're recording, you don't, and not enough of the instrument, even if the volume is, sounds right, the instrument isn't actually getting picked up enough by the interface. So when I would send the stems to him, some of them he just couldn't mess with that much because I didn't turn up my own like output enough. So like, I turned up the volume enough that I thought my output was good. But when he looked at the stems, it turned out there was very little. I just cranked my own volume. But the actual output that came out of the, car, the guitar wasn't that much in itself. So you can tell like these ones are much greater. So there's a lot for him to mess with those waveforms. This one is a lot smaller, you can really see. And it's just, there's not as much room to work with. So making sure, like, once we start recording more, making sure that our outputs and everything are the right level makes it easier for anybody that wants to work on your song post recording. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about it. Um, <laughs> so, we, um, especially in the beginning, we listen to a lot of music. Um, we got some good playlists going. Mine's like 1,800 songs. Mine's like newer, so it's like, yeah, 700. Yeah. And um, if you like the Beatles, um, we definitely got some influence. Mac DeMarco. Mac DeMarco is great. Tribe <laughs> Called Quest. You can really hear that. Um, um, Those artists you had on your first slide were definite. Yeah, like Elliot Smith, very big. John Mayer. Listen to a lot of Hendrix. A lot of Hendrix. 